thanks. Uh, it's great to see uh, at least one screen worth, and I'll I'll start scrolling through shortly to see my friends. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure. Gosh, back in August, you're right, teaching you then, and I very much also enjoyed the back and forth, and I'm looking forward to that at the end of each session over the next few weeks. Uh, today, I want to talk about the death of Moses, and in order to start, I want to start with, of all things, the Torah, because at the end of the Torah, in Deuteronomy, um, in chapter 32, verse 48, I'm going to read a little from the JPS translation. That very day the Lord spoke to Moses, Ascend these heights of Avarim to Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, facing Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I'm giving the Israelites as they're holding. You shall die on the mountain that you are about to ascend, and shall be gathered to your kin, as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his kin. And then, just a chapter or two later, in chapter 34, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were undimmed, his vigor unabated. And the Israelites bewailed Moses in the steps of Moab for 30 days. So first, just a note on Mount Nebo. Um, I, I don't know, and I, I, I can ask for hands, but I'm not sure I'll be able to see all of you. I have actually been to Mount Nebo. If you've been in Jordan and gone up Mount Nebo, you've had quite the experience. Um, you know, the rock and roll group, the band, has a little throwaway line in one of their albums to, that I'll stand on the rock where Moses stood. And that's really what I felt. We climbed up Nebo and um, passed all the mosaics from the churches on Nebo. And then you look, oddly enough, west. You look west to the Holy Land. Um, as a New Yorker, I always feel that about California. I look west to the Holy Land. But um, how uncanny to see exactly as it says in Deuteronomy, Moses saw. Because you cannot mistake that you're looking at Jericho, the city of palms. You see all the palm trees there. And then if you look downward, you see a thin little stream, which is the mighty Jordan River. And to see what Moses saw is an unbelievable moment. I always felt that that might be one of the saddest places on the face of the earth, because Moses was literally commanded by God to go up the mountain and die there. There was no coming back from that mountain. Moses knew perfectly well what his job was. His job was to die. And I thought how horrifying that is to see the land that for 40 years he yearned to go to, that as a child he heard about, that he promised his generation, and yet to know that he would never enter. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that maybe Moses was spared the tsuris of actually moving into the land, setting up a government building the buildings, fighting with the Canaanites, um, actually living in the land is a lot harder than yearning for it, as I think all of us in the diaspora know only too well. Um, but my image of Moses on Mount Nebo was shaped profoundly when I came to a midrash from the 10th, 9th century. Well, let's say 9th century. Um, as it happens, and for reasons that I'll explain to you in a moment, because I don't usually say things like this, but I am the world's expert on this midrash. The reason I'm the world's expert is I did my doctoral dissertation on it, and I produced an annotated English translation with the Yale Judaica series, and I produced a Hebrew critical edition that was published by the Jewish Theological Seminary. So having spent 10 years of my life on Midrash Mishlei, the Midrash to the Biblical Book of Proverbs, um, and no one else in the scholarly world was foolish enough to walk into that trap. Um, by default, I'm the world's expert on it. And um, one of the things I have to say that attracted me to this Midrash, this Midrash that's a thousand years old, was its treatment 
the stories that we're going to do over the next few weeks, the four stories of death. Um, one, as we'll read today, the death of Moses. And you will find it, I think, uncanny. Some of you may remember that 50 years ago now, in the late 1960s, a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published a very influential book on death and dying. And in that, Kubler-Ross argued that people go through stages. You don't always get through every stage, but people go through stages as they approach death. They have denial, they have anger, they bargain, they finally have some acceptance and maybe are even able to mourn themselves before they die. But um, Kubler-Ross, I'm certain, never read Midrash Mishle. Even though it existed for a thousand years before she wrote, she was not a reader of Hebrew texts by any measure. And so I'm certain she didn't know this text. For reasons that I hope are clear to you, I'm equally certain that the editor, author of Midrash Mishle did not know the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which tells me that over a thousand year span in very different parts of the world, two readers two people who contemplated, what does it mean to die? What does it mean to have a good death? How do you approach death? Wound up having very similar points of view. So as I started with the story of Moses and his death in the Bible, if Ari will put up on the screen the Midrash text, um, and I think he's also sent you a link to it if you want to open it elsewhere. Um, we will see, there we are, that um, our story is instructive, and I'm hoping in the Q&A at the end, I will make some comments along the way reading to you, um, that uh, there's a lot to be learned from how Moses approaches his death. Some of it good, some of it bad, some of it about Moses himself, and a lot of it also about how, as it were, Moses' family, if you will, the people Israel, us how we approached death, death, his death as well. So we open with Rabbi Abahu saying, come and see how hard it was at the hour of Moses, our master's departure from the world. When God told him, your time has come to depart the world, Moses began to scream and cry. This is denial. He asked God, master of the universe, Ribana Shaloylam. Moses says, was it for naught that I labored? Was it for nothing that I worked like a horse before your children? It sounds like such a modern phrase. And I assure you, I'm actually translating the medieval Hebrew. I work like a horse for your children. Now shall my finale be the grave? My end is dust? If you could see it my way, maybe you'll afflict me with suffering. But don't hand me over to the pangs of death. Now he's bargaining. Of this, David spoke. I'm not sure whether Moses is quoting King David, which would be odd, but hey, it's Midrash. Or it's our editor quoting and telling us he's about to quote Psalms. And Psalm 118 says, God afflict me with suffering. But give me not unto death. God says to Moses, look, I've taken an oath. God has bound God's self by oath. One sovereignty, malchut, one kingship, may not overlap another one, even by a hair's breadth. So far, up till now, you were king over the Jews. But the truth is, it's Joshua's turn now. Moses says to God, master of the universe, okay. In the past, I was the rav, I was the master, and Joshua was my Talmud, he was my disciple. So why don't now I'll be the disciple and he'll be my master. Just don't let me die. Mind you, Moses asked to suffer, and he had no idea what it would be like to be the rabbi emeritus. He just did not know what he was walking into. God, who is of infinite wisdom, says, okay, if you think you can do it, go right ahead. So God says, I'll accept your bargain for, for a while. God can see the future. God knows that Moshe can only endure this for so long, and that in truth, 
by this experiment, if you will, Moshe will find it appropriate that he is ready to die and will die on time. So now we go to section D. Moshe is now going to take up his new role as Joshua's disciple rather than the other way around. Moses immediately goes to Joshua's door, where he stood in service upon Joshua. His posture is bowed. His arms are crossed. I don't know if you can see me like this. It completely escaped Joshua's sight that it was Moses standing in service on him. This is really a reflection, and it's a brilliant reflection, of ancient um, Oriental and Jewish uh, relationship of master and disciple. Disciples went every morning. This they actually inherited from the Roman world as well. They were clients and they had patrons and they would go every single morning to greet their patron. They would go and on the way, maybe they would stop at Starbucks and pick up some croissant and they would come to greet their master and they'd say, good morning, my teacher. I brought you some breakfast. I hope you enjoy it. And the teacher would say, shalom aleichem. It's good to see you. And that's how the day would go. Of course, you should realize that if you were someone's patron, you might also have someone who's your patron. And that person may have someone who's their patron, which means that the patron of patrons in the Roman world, the Roman emperor, had to get up very early in the morning to start the whole um, chain of greetings in the morning. And when you were standing in service, waiting for your patron to notice you, you consciously adopted a servile posture. But if you think about this posture, you may also be seeing in your mind's eye a mummy, because this is the posture that people assumed when they were put bodily into the grave at death. So Moshe is already unconsciously mimicking his own death. And Joshua is oblivious to this. My wife has many famous sayings. One of them is that the oblivious are oblivious to their own oblivion. Joshua doesn't even know what he's missing. He doesn't realize that it's Moses because he wasn't part of the bargain with God. So as it's their custom, the Jews get up early and they go to Moses' door to pay their respects. But hey, he's not there. So they ask, where could Moshe be? And they were told, ah, he rose early in the morning to pay his respects at Joshua's door. Now, this should be very disturbing to them. And any of you who have dealt with elderly parents, you know this phenomenon, that you have a regular relationship, you have a regular order, you see them Sunday night for dinner, whatever it is, you know your parents and your parents are your parents, and then one day, they're not as sharp as they used to be, or they didn't pay their bills on time, or you have to take the car keys away from them. There is a moment where you don't find them there anymore. You go to do the normal order of things, and they are almost literally no longer there with you. And you have to adjust, and you have to adjust quickly, rapidly, and disturbingly. So they ask, Where's Moses? And they're told, Oh, he got up early to pay his respects at Joshua's door. So they went and they found Joshua seated and Moses, our master, Moshe Rabbeinu, standing. Now, this is completely not right. Moshe should be the one sitting and Joshua should be the one standing. And now Joshua's sitting in the presence of Moshe. Things are topsy-turvy. And that topsy-turviness indicates to me the presence somewhere in the room of the angel of death. Something's wrong. The order of the universe has been upended. So they say to him, Yehoshua, Yehoshua. For those of you that are Bible readers, you know that when a name is doubled, Avi, Avi, Moshe, Moshe, Avraham, Avraham, when they double a name, that is a, a moment of real emotional outburst. So they're outraged. But Yoshua, what did you do? Moshe Rabbeinu, your rabbi, is standing with his posture bound, 
and his hands crossed. And at that moment, Yehoshua finally realized, oh my God, it's Moshe. And he has to, you know, I expose embarrassingly say, oh, Moshe, I didn't notice you there. Can you imagine that? Moshe, he didn't notice him. So Joshua is, is just upset beyond measure. He literally prostrates himself before Moses. And he says, again, notice the doubling. Avi, avi, rabbi, rabbi. My father, my father. Now, we know that literally Moses was not Joshua's father. Joshua's father was Nun. And then he calls him Rabbi, Rabbi, my master, my master. I will tell you that biblical Hebrew, the word Rav, Ra, which we use as rabbi, biblical Hebrew, the word for rabbi, it certainly means master, but it mostly means the master of a slave. So Joshua is owning the fact that Moshe is his teacher, his master in every possible way. But he explicates a little. You are my father in that you raised me since I was a child. Indeed, if we read the biblical account, Joshua is almost always there. And you are my master in that you have taught me wisdom. You've taught me chokhmah. So now the game is up. Everybody knows something's very wrong. And Moshe is suddenly in this very servile posture. And he looks really weak. And so the sons of Aaron stand on Moses' right. And Joshua stands on his left. They're going to be there to support him. For those of you that remember your Bible, you may remember the story of the battle of Amalek. And at that battle, Moshe has to keep his hands up, and they stand on either side to support him. So in some way, they're almost helping Moshe relive his most glorious moment as a military commander. But they ask him point blank, Moshe Rabbeinu, Maze Asita, Moses, our master, what have you done? And Moses, I have to say, is a bit disingenuous here. He sounds like a little old Yiddish speaker. Leave me alone. This is what God told me. If you do this for Joshua, you won't die. Now, we all just read the narrative. God never said that to Moshe. But that's how Moshe heard it. Moshe heard, you do this small thing and you can stay alive. And Moshe now is trying to do what it turns out to be really, really hard. Shmuel Bar Nachmani has a very, very keen insight. He says, at that moment, when they actually realize what's going on, everybody wants to stone Joshua. Everybody's furious at Joshua. I have to say, I've been at JTS 50 years, that's 5-0, which means that I have been more or less in some kind of odd rabbinic role as an academic. And I've been a rabbi now for 45 years. But I'm not a congregational rabbi, which means that unlike some of my colleagues who can do a funeral every week, and I have some colleagues on Long Island that do two or three funerals every week, in my career, I say I've done maybe 40, 50 funerals. And, you know, if you do a funeral, and for you don't have to do the funeral, almost all of us on this call have been to a shiva call. And you know that in the room, in the shiva room, there's this quantum of anger floating around. Everybody's sniping at everybody else. Sisters are arguing with each other, husbands and wives. Parents are snapping at their children. Why are they so angry? They're angry because somebody died. And the truth is, they're often angry at the person who died. But nobody wants to say that out loud. Unless the person who died just, you know, wouldn't listen to the doctor and, you know, ate pizza three times a day, et cetera, et cetera. Most people recognize that the person who died didn't really want to die. And therefore, the anger, this quantum of anger, often has no place to go. I tell my students, by the way, that it's not infrequent that the anger is targeted at the rabbi because 
they can say about the rabbi, oh, I didn't like his, his eulogy. Never mind that the rabbi, in fact, only said direct quotes from what he heard from relatives. Um, you know, it, it just it's so easy to be angry at, if you will, the person who's the stand-in for God. And this Midrash is saying something quite remarkable. Because as we'll see what happens, they want to stone Joshua. They're furious that Joshua is taking over and Moshe is weak. Um, imagine a family where the parents have always been business people. They've always been effective. They've always supported their children. And then one day, as I suggested earlier, they find out mom or dad didn't pay their bills this month. What happened? Oh, I, I forgot. And suddenly, and it's usually the closest female relative, suddenly has to take over the job of paying the bills in the family. And you can pretty much bet that the rest of the siblings resent that person enormously. All of their frustration that mom and dad aren't what they used to be is actually now being taken out on the person who's stepping up. And it's completely unfair. So what does God do? They want to stone Joshua to death. And God interposes, just like God did with the Egyptians when the Israelites were trapped between the sea and the Egyptian army. The pillar of cloud interposes between them. It's almost as though God is saying, Kinder, give me your anger. You can be as pissed off at God as you want to be. God will endure it. You can shoot all the arrows you want. The cloud will just envelop them and no harm will be done. God's like this big soft pillow that you beat up or scream into. And I think our Midrash is suggesting that we should adopt this role, that the anger that we have, that the frustration we have in the moment of a loved one's death, direct that not at yourself, not at your loved ones, but direct it at God. Say, God, why did you take them away? And God will endure. God will somehow absorb your anger and still be there to console you. So now the people are really desperate. They want Moses to go back to his old role. So they say to Moshe, Moshe, siyem lanu batorah. Will, will you finish the Torah for us? And our Midrash very delicately says, the traditions were forgotten by Moses. And he did not know what to answer them. I can't read this without thinking of my own family situation. My in-laws, uh, my mother-in-law is 90, my father-in-law is 98. And Ken and Hara, they have their medical issues, but we're watching both of them be begin to forget things. And it's hard to watch. It's hard to see a mother-in-law who was always sharp as a tack and missed nothing. Now starting... We have you back. We, we thought we were having the problems out here in California. No, I think JTS is down. I'm not sure. I was trying on my phone. But um, clearly, back. Some, somewhere in Zoom, they didn't like the fact that Moshe was not ready to finish the Torah. Um, and that was what I was talking about. The people asked Moshe, fit, you know, conclude the Torah. And Moshe doesn't know what to say. And he doesn't know what to say for a good reason. Because I started with the end of the Torah. For Moses to conclude the Torah is for Moses to say out loud that he's dying, that he's up on Mount Nebo, that God commanded him to die, and that the people will mourn him for 30 days. So Moshe is completely stuck there. But he's not as stuck as we think, because he recognizes the failure. At this failure, Moshe falls on his face, and he says, Ribono shalom, lam. Tov moti mechayai. I love this. Moshe himself says, my death is better than my life. But our darshan is winking at us because Moshe is here quoting the book of Jonah. This is what we read on the Haftorah on Yom Kippur afternoon when we say, my death is better than life. There is a recognition on Yom Kippur. There's a recognition in Yonah. And there's a recognition in this Midrash that sometimes we have to die. 
the reality is, and I'm sorry to say this out loud, I hope I'm not shocking anyone, but everybody on this call is going to die. We're all mortal. And I think we don't usually reckon with our mortality. It's just too frightening. It's like Moshe not being able to finish the Torah. Being able to reckon with our mortality takes enormous, enormous self-possession and self-knowledge. I think you have to have a serious disease before you finally recognize emotionally what you might know intellectually, which is we're mortal. Um, I had prostate cancer. I had surgery. And only at that point did I finally realize, wow, maybe I'm not going to live forever. I think it's real. So this is Moshe at that moment. Moshe falls on his face and he says to God, well, God, I suppose death is better than living, especially living like this. And when God saw that Moshe had reconciled himself, then God's self gave a eulogy. God said, who will stand up for me for this nation of wicked? Who will watch for me on behalf of this nation of evildoers? And then, as it were, God does a midrash on the verse in Psalms. Who will stand up to me in the wars of my children when they sin before me? Many of my students have really focused on this line, and there's what to love about it. God recognizes that even God will not be unchanged by this death. And I think that's something we all know, that when a loved one dies, when someone we're close with dies, when someone we work with all the time dies, even when a national figure dies, our lives somehow change. They must change. And if it's a parent or a child, God forbid, who dies, we're bereft. And I think it's heartening. I think it's heartening. And maybe in the Q&A, you can jump in on this to know that even God has to recognize that God will change of necessity with Moshe no longer there. Now the angel Michael comes and bows before the Almighty. The angel says to God, Master of the universe, I don't get it. Moshe was yours in life. So Moshe is yours in death. What's the big deal? Why don't you just take him? And God responds to the angel, I'm not only lamenting for Moses, but also for the Jews. I, I, you know, God read the Bible, as it were. <laughs> Many times the Jews had sinned, and Moshe stood and prayed and abated my wrath, as it says, again, quoting Psalms, God would have destroyed them, but for Moses, God's chosen one, who stood in the breach and assuaged God's anger from destroying fury. This is like the parents that one spouse dies and the other spouse says, wow, you know, my husband always used to be able to calm me down and I wouldn't get into a fury over the kids. And now if the kids do something wrong, my husband's not here anymore. I'm going to have to calm myself down. I can't rely on that any longer. Things inexorably change. And when they change, we, the survivors, have to change. So now they come and they say to Moshe, your moment from for departure from the world has arrived. Moshe, it's time. And Moshe turns to the Jews and says, Israel, my children, forgive me. I know I've given you a lot of source. And they say, Rabbeinu Moshe, machulacha, machulacha. We forgive you. We forgive you. And then they turn and say, Moshe, forgive us for all that we've angered you. And God knows the Israelites got Moshe plenty angry in the 40 years in the wilderness. And he says, my children, you're forgiven. I want to interrupt this, the narrative here because I taught this text, must be 30 years ago, in a summer school class. And almost every single person taking the class was doing hospital chaplaincy rounds at the time. And one of the students told a very poignant story to illustrate this text. He said that he was counseling 
a father who was dying of AIDS. And his children, who were so angry because he had gotten AIDS because he was gay. And he never had revealed that to the children. They thought he was straight and married to their mother. And suddenly there he was with AIDS. And they rejected him. And he didn't know what to do, how to console this man who was now dying. And his own family had abandoned him. So he took it upon himself. And it was a big risk to call the, the children. And it turned out that there were two sons and they expressed in no uncertain terms to the rabbi how furious they were with their father. And the rabbi had the presence of mind to say, yes, I understand that. I don't deny your anger, but he's still your father and he's dying. You need to come to the hospital. And they came. And when they came to the hospital room, the father saw his two adult children and burst into tears. And he said to his sons, please forgive me. I'm gay. I've hidden that all my life and I hid it from you. And I sure didn't want to get AIDS. But it is who I am. And I know I've hurt you. Forgive me. And they forgave him. And then they said, Dad, we're here now, and we were probably wrong to abandon you. We were angry, but we forgive you, and we want you to forgive us. And the family was able to reconcile. And this was an enormous gift to all of them, that the father could die and die knowing that his family saw him as he was, who he was. So the idea that you have enough presence, you have enough knowledge of your impending death, to make amends, to say, my children, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, is a huge moment to have. Now they come and say, half a moment remains for you to depart the world. And Moshe now can mourn his own death. He takes his hands and he folds them on his heart. Remember how we opened, he was like this. Now he's like this. He's getting ready for the grave. And he weeps. Moshe is mourning himself. But he also knows, I was Moshe. I was pretty special. And guess what? The two hands that received the Torah from the mouth of the Almighty, even though I thought that made me immortal, I'm still a human being. Even though I saw God face to face, I'm still a human being. And because I'm a human being, I will die. They finally come and say, okay, Moshe, your time is up. And he cries to God. And only at the end of all of this does he ask the following question. Ribon, ribon ha'olamim, master of both worlds. If you take my soul in this world, will you return it to me in the coming future? This is an amazing thing. Usually the rabbis are quick to invoke the world to come, bodily resurrection in the world to come. We pray for it when we pray three times daily. But our rabbi, our storyteller, has basically deferred it to the very end of the story. Not unlike the Bible. The Bible doesn't talk about resurrection in the world to come, at least not in the Torah and certainly not in the story of Moses. But here we've gone through all the stages, all the emotional work that Moshe's done. And finally, God says, Moshe says to God, so will there be a second act? Will I have as it, as it were an encore? And God says, by your life, chayacha. Do you appreciate the irony of this? Moshe has a nanosecond left to live. And God takes a bow by that little bit that's left. It, in some very real way, I think, shows us the narrator, the rabbi's own insecurity about life in the hereafter, about resurrection. They share the same insecurities that we do. We don't know what's going to happen after we die. We don't know if we'll come back. But God wants to console Moshe. And God says to Moshe, just as you were the head of them in this world, in the messianic future, 
you will be again. And he quotes Deuteronomy, the very end of the Torah, Vayata Rashayam, he comes at the head of his people. So he's basically taking a verse of Deuteronomy and now applying it to the messianic future. As it were, we're going to interpret this that Moses will be resurrected and Moshe will again become the head of the Jews. A, a naughty part of me thinks that Moshe says, uh, maybe I could come back not the head of the Jews. Like, I'm fine in my retirement. Thank you. But Moshe gets the promise he needs. And why is it that Moshe is given this extraordinary promise? Because of the righteousness he performed for Israel. As it says, Sikat Hashem Asa Umishpatavi Israel. He did the righteousness of God. His judgments are with the Jews. And Rabbi Nechemia explains, in case you didn't get it, what was it that Moshe did? Moshe taught them Torah, Moshe taught them Halacha, and Moshe taught them Tzedek. He taught them righteousness. So there's a lot of material here, and I think it's enormously complex. And I, I'm going to say again, because I think it really reflects the almost current modern understanding. I mean, I know in the 50 years since Kubler-Ross wrote, a lot of people have doubted her or questioned her, especially since she herself became a mystic. But I think there are some essential truths here. And um, I don't know whether people have entered anything into the chat, but I hope at this point that some of you have either questions you want to ask or maybe even comments. You know, as I look around the screen, and you'll forgive me, I can only see one screen in front of me right now, but um, I'm not looking at a screen of teenagers. We're all old enough to know and to have thought about death. We're old enough to have lost people that we love. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to talk about how we cope and whether the lessons this Midrash teaches us are in fact at all useful a thousand years after the Midrash. Ruth, I think you had your hand up for a second there. Ruth Levor, Lever, can you unmute her or unmute yourself? Trying, okay. There we go. I was trying between chat and raising my hand. Cause, okay. Okay, but, but um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much. This is a, a wonderful, uh, not only a drosh, but also uh, bringing the drosh to us as Rabbeinu and giving us, you know, life lessons for today out of it, which I really appreciate. It seemed to me, however, in the, in the Torah portion that Moses went uh, to die alone. And in the Midrash, the Midrashist, as it were, gives him a gift of having all the people around him uh, when he died. And I wondered what you thought about that. And that's a very keen perception, which I, I'll be frank with you, having taught this a zillion times, I haven't really thought about the fact that what you say is true, that he situated Moses not alone, but still within the community he led. And, and I think that's a very important insight that the passage, however difficult it is, is, easy, is easier, is better facilitated when you are in a community of people who know you and love you. They may be angry, they may be bewildered, but it's still your community. And, and I think that's equally true of family. Nobody really wants to die alone. Nobody wants to go up on that mountain and say, this is what I did not achieve in my life. What you want is to be surrounded by your family, by your community. And even then, if you have to say, I'm ready to die, at least you know that you're with the people who cared for you. So I thank you for that insight. I think it's very, very useful. Ellen Weisberger. Thank you, Rabbi. On this Parsha, it was my understanding that Moses, God did not let Moses die just because he was old and it was his time to die, but he did not want Moses to lead the Israeli people to the promised land. He wanted a new leadership. What's your perspective on that? 
that piece of the Torah, and it's explicit in the Torah, it, it so breaks my heart that I did not, Alan, I admit, I did not read it when I read the passage about Moses' death. God says quite explicitly, you broke faith with me. You didn't do what I commanded. And because of that, I'm going to punish you and not let you into the promised land. And, you know, that's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, but it's the way reality works. None of us get to do everything we want to do. And most of us don't get to do perhaps the thing we most want to do. Um, and God remains mysterious and sometimes nasty and vindictive. Um, and, you know, I'm saying these things. This is not just my opinion. I've read the Torah. God is a very difficult character. My old teacher, and he was in his 80s when I studied with him, a European, one of the great Talmudists of all time, Saul Lieberman. Lieberman once asked, who is the most tragic character in the Bible? So, you know, some of us said, Job. No, 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 not Job. Abraham. No, 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 not Abraham. And finally, the answer he was looking for was God. God is the most tragic character. And I think that the biblical view of God, and most often the rabbi's view of God, is a view of a God who is very complex, often vindictive, and unfortunately beautifully reflects the disappointments of daily reality. I, I saw in the chat um, someone named Mona Fishbane, um, and <laughs> who's an old friend. Mona, I, I ask you, unmute and ask your question aloud, and also tell me if you are um, reflecting on some of the other lessons you heard um, in class this week, not with me. Hi, <laughs> it's good to see you and wonderful to learn with you. Um, I don't think I'm reflecting on other classes. Uh, I'm in a million classes, but I don't think we've touched on this topic. I, I, my experience, and I think it's been written about in the field, is that um, while we definitely want, and I think it's a gorgeous story you told about your, your trainee who um, facilitated a healing at the end. It's just really touches my heart and I've known stories like that too. So yes, the people around, but also that many people can't die when they're surrounded by their loved ones. Um, it's, it's famously known like in hospitals that they wait until the, the spouse leaves the room or the kids leave the room and in the middle of the night they depart. Um, I know that was true with my, with my father. We were all huddling around him, singing his songs, waiting for the moment. And finally, we all gave up and went to sleep. And I, I, we were all around the apartment. I was on a mattress at the foot of my parents' bed. And I fell asleep to the sound of my mother snoring and my father gasping for air as he was dying. And two hours later, I woke up and only heard my mother snoring. So granted, he was in bed with my mother, but the, the hovering, the, the love that we were almost like, was too much. And he had to like have a little space, I think, to, to pass. And I've heard many stories like that. I, I, I think you're right. So first of all, Mona, am, am, is my memory correct? You, you, in fact, are a therapist. Yeah, I'm a psychologist. Okay. So um, Mona comes from real serious knowledge of, of these issues, in addition to her own personal knowledge. And, and I think there's what to be said for that, that um, sometimes people simply can't let go. And there's stories in the Talmud about that as well, that uh, rabbis their parents or, or their teachers couldn't die until they gave them, as it were, privacy. And maybe um, one of the stories we'll read, the very last one, the story of Rabbi Akiva's death, which is not what you think it is, um, might reflect that as well, that um, people have such a powerful desire to be in community. And, and by the way, I think we see this now that sometimes against all our better judgment because of COVID, we still wind up going to shul when maybe we shouldn't be, or we go here or there um, because we just need to be with other people. And to let go of that, to let go of life, you need to be completely isolated because if there are other people around, well, you want to be part of the conversation. And I, I think that's real. And it's real even if part of the conversation means that you're, you're snoring in harmony. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I'm told that I snore. And since I love my wife, I believe her. And I'm trying to convince her that when I snore, what I'm saying to her is I love you. Um, I'm not sure she's buying that uh, if I wake her up, but uh, 
you're putting your finger on something very powerful though and that is the the hold community has on us the tether to our lives and for us to break that tether for even god or the angel of death to break that tether maybe we do need to be isolated um i i don't have a good answer aaron boxer i i see your hand is up and then ari i'm going to ask you to field some of the people in the chat too yeah I'll, I'll wrap it up after aaron so i have a question about the text yes on the first the, the first paragraph of the page two the very last sentence when it says but the traditions were forgotten by moses and he did not know what to answer them i read that as he had lost his memory you know which happens when you get old and, and, and I think you read it uh, somewhat differently. And I was wondering what you thought. I, I'm, I'm actually looking in the Hebrew text. Uh, the, Hebrew, okay. the Hebrew text says, Siim lano batarah, conclude the Torah for us. And then it says, Venish katchu misarot me Moshe, that Moshe forgot the, the traditions and didn't know what to answer them. And I, I think... On one hand, you're right. I think we're dealing with a, an elderly man. Moshe is 120 years old. And the Torah may say that he still had his vigor. Literally, it says he still had his moisture. Um, but we know that at 120, he's got a rather fragile memory. Um, so it could simply be he forgot. But I also think there's a part of denial here because I know how the Torah ends. And maybe Moshe didn't know, but he could anticipate he was after all a prophet that to write the end of the torah meant he had to author his own death so um i like my reading i like your reading so we're, we're almost out of time just a, a few last questions for today first of all i i have shared the materials and i'll reshare them in a follow-up email to this program so you'll all have them for next time uh, before we get to the preview for next week um let's talk about the book of michelet you know just as a starter you know why do people not read it? Why did you read it? And what else is in there that we should know? So, you know, you're asking a great question because the book of Proverbs, Mishle, is one of the very few books um, that is one of these small books that has no liturgical place. Um, you know, all five of the Megillot we read during the holidays. Uh, the five books of Moses we read, you know, in the annual cycle. We read a lot of the prophets as Haftorahs. We read Psalms in part of our davening. And Mishle is like just the cheese stands alone in the corner there. And yet, I was stunned that the Midrash on Mishle had literally dozens of manuscripts, that it was incredibly popular. And I think that Jews read Mishle as a quintessential book of wisdom. They read Mishle, the book of Proverbs just to learn how to get along in the world. It's full of good advice. And I commend it to you. It's really fascinating reading. And I, I would say there's virtually no chapter that you'll read in the book of Proverbs that you won't find yourself saying, uh-huh, yeah, I know that. Right, that's, that's so true. Um, so I don't have a good answer why it's not in the cycle, except that I think on its own, it was sufficiently popular that the rabbis didn't need to build a buttress for it. Okay. Uh, well, we'll take, we have one more hand up from Linda. We'll have Linda's question, then I'll wrap it up. Um, I was intrigued by, the, by uh, God's comment, by your life. And it seems that that's that very poignant question that we, none of us know how to uh, answer or address. And that the answer is sufficiently ambiguous. It could mean a variety of things. I'm wondering how you interpret that by your life. So, because I, I spend my career reading rabbinic literature, right? You can see a wall full of books. I know that it is a very popular interjection to say, chayacha or bechayacha. And it's, it's a, the kind of, it's, it's not quite an oath formula, but it's, it's, a, um, it's just a way you interject into a conversation. Um, it would be like, I suppose, the equivalent of by George or by golly um, or by God. Um, I think our storyteller chose it with irony. 
that he has God saying by your life when we've just been informed that God has left less than a second left in the life, which I think is the storyteller's way of saying, I'm going to tell you the standard rabbinic trope that we will all be resurrected from the dead and have life in the world to come. But I'm going to qualify it with this very dubious by your life. Now, I say that, and I'm keenly aware that I may be projecting my own lack of faith in the world to come, or my own questions about the world to come. I'd love to believe we'll all be bodily resurrected, and we'll all be dancing the horror in Jerusalem. Um, and I'd also love to believe that if we dance the horror in Jerusalem, we're going to do it at that section of the wall that allows men and women to dance together. Um, but now you know I'm thinking messianically. So, I, so it, Linda, I, I think I, I, I'm concerned about my own projection. I'm only reading through my own lenses. But I think I know this bird well enough. God knows I've spent enough time with the editor of Midrash Mishle. Um, I mean, decades now. That I think this is a very subtle way of him signaling to us. Maybe, but maybe not. Great. Great questions. Thank you for some great and thoughtful answers and for a great presentation. Before we get to the um, promo for what we're going to cover next week, I will say that I have this idea for CSP where I choose some very interesting thought leaders in the Jewish world and ask them the hardest questions. And one will be, what happens when you die? And then you get like five minutes to answer the question, and then I'll compile it and we'll share it on our CSP YouTube. So first of all, you will be on that. So you better start thinking about your answer. And it could be, it's just an honest answer. Whatever you think, what happens, hopefully based in your worldview and your tradition. Okay, so let's get, uh, can you give us a promo for what we're doing next week? Because we're talking about two other stories of death and dying in the Midrash. So next week, I'm combining two narratives that I usually teach separately, but the thread that binds them is they're both stories about Robbie Mayer. Robbie Mayer, a great second century, first late first second century rabbi, um, who was by trade a scribe. Robbie Mayer was a disciple of the apostate Elisha Benabuya. But there's also a very famous story, first told in the Midrash to Proverbs, about the death of Mayer's two children and how he and his wife cope with the death of children. So on one side, you have the death of two innocent children. On the other side, you have the death of a parent figure, a teacher, who is in fact unrepentant and an apostate. And in both narratives, we see how Alicia, the, uh, I'm giving myself away here, how Alicia Benavuya dies unrepentant, and how Mayer, with a little help from his friends, is able to reconcile himself to Alicia's death and to console himself after the death of his children. And, and I think those are important life skills that we all need to learn. And I, again, I think Midrash Mishle is working very hard to give us a coherent, worldview on how to cope with these kind of tragedies. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, dealing with a very um, important subject. Um, you know, um, we're still in the thick of COVID and um, many of us have lost people, or people who have suffered. So um, we, you know, we have to deal with these issues and, it's, and I appreciate having you as a guide and also um, having you uh, teach us from texts that maybe most of us don't read. Uh, many of us maybe have not read Proverbs. If you read Proverbs, maybe we haven't read the Midrash. Well, I, know, I know some of you have, um, but also you add nuance to all that as well. So thank, thank you, Professor Vazonsky. I'll see you guys um, later this week or next week. Take care, be safe, and um, go visit your parents, I guess. <laughs> go visit your parents if they're still around. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.